Hello everybody, reporting live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 68 of the Movement Debrief. And tonight, folks, this debrief is gonna be nice. We're gonna talk about ooh, perfect posture. How are you gonna make yourself look pretty when you're not moving? Does it even matter? Probably not, but stay tuned. We're gonna talk about, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Oh, excessive knee bend. Oh, what happened when you're doing maybe some type of yoga type thing and you're trying to keep your legs straight and it doesn't happen, what you gonna do about it? I'll give you the answer for that. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about SFMA. What are my thoughts on it? Why don't I use it? I got no beef with it, but why don't I use it? I will answer all of those questions because these are questions that are asked from the people, answered for the people by this people. Fam recognize fam. Before I dive in, folks, do you have someone who is struggling getting a push up just right? Maybe they're doing the turtle head kind of thing. Maybe they're doing the, oh, I gotta hit my belly there first. And despite your best coaching efforts, you don't know what to do about it because it doesn't change. Did you ever consider that maybe there is a movement limitation present that you just don't know how to address until now? Because December 8th and 9th in Charleston, South Carolina, Humatrix is coming your way. It will also be in New Providence, New Jersey, February 2nd and 3rd, I think. Don't quote me on that. Man, I should know this down pat by now. It is. February 2nd and 3rd, ooh, I didn't know it down pat. I will also be there to answer that very question. And if you only want part of me, but you want to join myself, Pat Davidson and Seth Obers into a grandioso seminar called The Revolution. You'll probably want to check that out February 9th and 10th, and that will be in Boston, Massachusetts. That is the set list in terms of my stuff this upcoming year. Got a few others in the books, but stay tuned. I will debrief you on those once I get more information. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from my boy Charlie Reed. A legend if you don't know him. Hey Zach, hope you're well my brother. I am. I have a question for you regarding posture resources. Do you have any descriptive videos or articles that help clients understand that doing extension-based exercises are not always ideal? Namely, those that are motivated to improve their posture, but maybe need to understand how to better how, uh, understand better how ribs slash respiration play in their ability to elongate without compressing their back line and spilling the guts out the front. I hate when that happens. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Charlie, I did not have a resource until now, so I'm going to answer your question. What is perfect posture? Eh, I hate this, but I think most conventional people would argue that there ought to be a straight line through your center of mass, which is about S, S3-ish, and it ought to go from above ooh, the mastoid process back yeah chromium process on the shoulder, down through the hips, a little bit behind the uh, ankle, I think. And ideally we should be able to stand in that position and look super duper pretty. The problem is no one is there. I think it's a bunch of baloney. I think posture in, it doesn't really matter until it matters. What I think is more important, and this is where you have to educate people, Charlie, is we want to be able to assume multiple postures, positions, orientations, strategies, which is what I like to use. Because if I sit in perfect posture, whatever that means, just step shoulders back, however your mama taught you, you have no idea how many mothers I have to yell at on a regular basis. But if I'm here like this and I don't move, tissues are gonna get overloaded. If I'm uh, slouchy, you know, typing on the computer kind of thing, same thing. Tissues are going to get overloaded. Neither is desirable, or what is not desirable, I should say, is stagnation. We need options. That's what we have to educate our people on. When I am this, and I'm trying to get here, i.e. I'm slouchy and I'm trying to get up tall, ball till you fall, 
doing extension-based movements are not likely, are highly unlikely to get you there. And the reason why is because we're not accounting for things that would establish normal, normal, I'll use that in quotes, spinal curvature. If I just get everything upright, chest tall, shoulders back, that's going to keep the spine relatively flat. This is not cool because guess what, folks? The spine isn't normally supposed to be flat. Normal spinal mechanics would be get it to be curvy. You would have a cervical lordosis. That's a little bit excessive, but I'm excessive. You should have thoracic kyphosis, where it should be a little bit more flexed, maybe. You should have cervical, well, I said cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, and then a sacral kyphosis. How is only going in one direction, i.e. extension, going to get you that? Short answer, it's not. What will, though, is restoring your movement capabilities, your movement options, giving yourself multiple strategies. The way I advocate that is exactly what my man Charlie Reed is talking about, and that is breathing. When you breathe, your body has to assume all of those positions that we're trying to get with this perfect posture. When I take a breath of air in, my thoracic spine ought to increase in kyphosis. My lumbar spine ought to reduce its lordosis. When I blow out, it should be the exact opposite. So if you only have one possible strategy and not another, you got problems, fam, and you probably look ugly. Or at least your posture is, is a joke, but whatever. Mine's kind of jokey joke maker anyways. What you have to do is restore those options that you lack. And maybe, 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 that allows you to assume multiple postures and positions. It starts by making sure you can pressurize the thoracic abdominal pelvic cavity trademark effectively, and that means being able to bucket handle, being able to get some pump handle activity in the front of the rib cage, get some posterior thorax expansion, restore some movement down in the hips, making sure you can orient the, the pelvis as a whole, anteriorly and posteriorly. And if you do those things, you'll probably be able to assume as many postures as you so desire. The one place where it can be a little challenging, and if, if you need links on how to do that, I'll link something on the show notes to, to walk you through some options for X section. Okay. The one place where it might get a little tricky is if you have a structural impairment in your cranium. For example, if I am someone who has a type 2 malocclusion, which if you don't know what that is, I'll link that in the show notes as well. So talk about it. That's basically where the mandible is more retruded, i.e. you got an overbite. What that position of the mandible will do is that will actually shove the head a bit more forward. The cranium will go more forward. You got a fan with the over or a forward head posture, like that. You can have the reverse, where if I got a type 3 malocclusion, I'm in more of a retracted position or military posture. And it may be that there is some type of structural issue that doesn't change with typical interventions that you may possess. And maybe you have to go see someone to get that taken care of, that meaning a dentist. And maybe a dentist would be able to manipulate some things with your cranial structure, with your jaw, and that can have an impact on posture. Something to consider. I would also argue that probably if you lack the ability to breathe through your nose, that could impact your posture. For example, if I can't breathe through my nose, that same person may assume a forward head posture because that opens up the oral airway a bit more. Jaw drops because the hyoid is depressed and you can get more air through your mouth. How are you going to fix that? I don't care what manual techniques, what Alexander technique you use, or what activities you use. If you have a structural issue up here, that is going to have a potential negative impact on your posture. So if you want to look pretty, you may have to get that checked out as well. My hope is over the next couple years, I will do the same for myself. And if you think I'm good looking now, just wait till I get my face fixed. Anyways, those would be the big things that I would consider Charlie in regards to posture, but more importantly, 
we want to make sure that our clients know that there is no one correct posture. What is correct is multiple movement options. Posture, not always associated with pain, unless being in that position for a prolonged period of time leads to pain. Another thing we want to make sure that our people know. If you want to fix your posture, restore your movement capabilities, make sure you can breathe because that is the, probably the easiest way I've found to improve some of these limitations that we, we may have. And that's not just from a functional standpoint, but also potentially a structural standpoint. Extension is not going to cut it, Charlie, and the reason why it's not going to cut it is because you're only going into one direction, your spine is curved. If you do those things and you educate your people in that regard that it's not one correct posture, but there's many, you ought to be in business. Charlie, amazing question. Next question comes from my boy, my BA, VA, A, virtual system, and a uh, budding physiotherapist himself, Chris, asks, my new friend from yoga class was wondering why her back knee keeps wanting to bend in the high lunge pose. I will link a picture of the high lunge pose. But basically, I'm not a yogi, so please bear with me. You're kind of in a split stance position. Your back leg's supposed to be straight, arms are going over that. How embarrassing is it for me to show my shoulder flexion in front of you beautiful people? Anyways, her back knee keeps wanting to bend in the high lunge pose. I quickly mentioned the rectus femoris, but then I realized I wasn't as prepared for the question as I once was. My quick answer was essentially to suggest her practicing her pose with a little bit more posterior pelvic tilt on the back leg if she wants to be more in a straight line here. I'm sure it's be more straight here. Pros, cons to this adaptation? Is this something you'd like to deep dive into? Yes. Have you already? No. Keep crushing. Hashtag fam recognize fam. Chris, I recognize you. Great question. Why would someone bend their back leg? And it's not just with this pose. Maybe you got someone who's sprinting and they do the knee bend kind of trick or walking. Anything where the hip has to be flexed on one side and extended on the other. That hip separation, which I debriefed about last week, and this is where it manifests itself again, is incredibly relevant. Let me get my femurs on. When a hip goes into flexion, which is what's occurring in the front leg on uh, the high lunge pose, the pelvic outlet this part, where the babies come out of, or the infrapubic angle, ought to open up. So as I flex, pelvic outlet opens. When I extend fully, the pelvic outlet ought to close on that side. In order to assume a pose such as the high lunge pose, you need to be able to open up the outlet on one side and close it on the other. Well, what happens if you get into that position and you can't do that action with your pelvis? When I go to extend the hip, uh-oh, wait a minute, I'm having a hard time opening or closing the pelvis, I don't know what to do. You bend, because you can't create that hip separation, you bend your knee to actually get a little bit of hip flexion to make the position easier. So you don't need that crazy hip separation. What you're going to do about it is probably the question you're asking me. I'm glad you asked. What you're going to do about it is work simply on that. Working on maximally flexing one hip or maximally extending the other. What that ought to do is restore the dynamic capabilities in the pelvis and maybe, maybe, your yoga pose looks like, whoa, that's pretty good. That's what we're shooting for. I, I like the drill last week that I like, but if you want to do something that's maybe a little bit closer to the pose itself, <clears throat> what I might recommend 
is doing some type of stride position where maybe you're putting your foot on, I mean, this is like a classic hip flexor stretch, man. But you put your foot on an elevated surface like I am with the chair right now. You get maybe not arms overhead because that's a little bit more challenging, but arms forward. Do a back pocket tuck here. See if you can straighten your knee. And that should get you some glute max. We get glute max, we get a restoration of hip extension. Life is good. Especially if, you're, if you are working on your ability to keep your knee straight. You could progress that to something like a wall acceleration drill. Another drill I've been using liberally that I love. Anything can work to make that happen. The sky's the limit. <clears throat> what I may do if you're going directly to the pose is if you are trying to go with a really big stance to start and try to get in position, just shorten it up. Get a little bit of weight on your backside. Back pocket tuck so you get gluteus maximus on the back leg. Try to keep the leg straight and then work on your forward lean. If that's still too much, you could get into half kneeling position because that is the same thing as a high lunge pose. You are just eliminating a portion of the leg you're standing on. Working in that position, working on the same tuck, even with the arms overhead, could be potentially very helpful, especially if you get a right good max. And then you can just work your way up into a full lunge. That would be the strategy that I would advocate to summarize your question, Chris, and for your friend, the reason why the knee bend in the back leg is occurring is because the hip is trying to flex because I have lost dynamic capabilities in the pelvis. You want to work on separating the hips. Hip flexion, hip extension. Ways to do that, the hip flexion and extension. Some of the variations that I, I showed earlier are the things I use. I'll link a few others that I might like in the show notes. But what, what your friend needs to do, Chris, is she needs to be able to get glute max into that position whilst keeping the knee straight. And if she does that, perhaps her yoga sessions will be a little bit less sorry and a little bit more like, dang girl, you got some good yoga skills. If you do that, we should be good. Chris, great question. Appreciate you, big dog. We'll be in touch. The last question comes from, wow, we got 13, that's amazing. The last question comes from David, perhaps David. David asks, interesting podcast. Well, thank you. I'll link the podcast in the show notes. They thought it was interesting. I thought, uh, you know, performance. Since you seem to advocate checking joint range of motion throughout the entire body, what are your concerns? with the SFMA, which seems to do this. Is it mainly the classification system, as you touch on in the podcast, or is it a question of focus? Start with ISA, then get into each joint range of motion, or something else. David, great question. I will do my best to answer that question for you. Let me preface this. I'm not going to, I'm going to do my best to not make this an SFMA bashing contest. There's a lot of good uh, practitioners and friends of mine who I know utilize the SFMA with great success. That's not my intention by any means. Because I don't think the assessment, well, I, I mean, I do think the assessment process matters, but what matters beyond that is the outcome. Not the one you're looking for, but the one your patients and clients are looking for. If you can utilize the SFMA to help meet that outcome and you have good intent, i.e. you have good rationalization for the decisions you make and you execute those decisions masterfully and you get the outcome that's intended? I don't care. I don't care what you use. But I will tell you why I don't use the SFMA. Is it mainly the classification system and the uh, focus? I would say both of those things definitely play a role. Let me preface this though by my understanding of the SFMA. I took the level one shows how old I am, back in 2013, I think, 2014, and I've done the advanced. I've read uh, Gray Cook's book, and I've taken FMS level one, level two. Am I an expert in these systems? No, not at all. Um, oh, Karen, I will comment later on that. 
So I'm not an expert by any means in the SFMA. But what I can say that I do know in regards to those systems is some of the things that may be a lax that was a reason why I didn't gravitate towards it. From an assessment process, one of the big things that I noticed was missing, aside from the ankle, and maybe this has changed because it has been a hot minute since I've taken it, is a lack of frontal plane measures. Also, there were several other measures missing within all of the joints. Me personally, I want to try to look at any possible movement limitation that an individual may have to try to maximize movement variance. If you're missing an entire plane, you might not be hitting all of the movement capabilities that an individual may or may not have. For example, there are no frontal plane hip measures last I checked. I do appreciate the ankle measures, but if we're not getting the hip measures as well, yeah, that's kind of a hard sell for me. Other thing, the classification system, yeah, I'm not a big fan of it. I don't like calling people dysfunctional. Um, not painful. Oh, you got you know two DNs and two DPs. No one wants to get DP'd, if you know what I'm saying. But I think that um, also in regards to the classification system, and I don't know if this is still true, so correct me if I'm wrong. But they they classify some of these limitations as either a tissue extensibility dysfunction, your TED, or a joint mobility dysfunction, a JMD. I think based on what we know from some of the contemporary manual therapy research, most of the changes, although some people might think otherwise, but a lot of the changes are probably neurophysiologic in origin. We're likely not able to change tissues. If you have a legitimate joint mobility and dysfunction, you're probably going to need to call a doctor because you got OA. To say that we can specifically target certain structures when we're performing a manual intervention is a hard sell for me. And that is partly the crux of how they perform their treatments in the SFMA, which would be your uh, reset, which would be a manual technique, your reinforcement, which might be taping or something along those lines, and your reload. So if you have you know, a, a, a issue in terms of philosophical, or an issue of intent, I should say, or rationalization, eh, you know, that just doesn't do it for me. But that being said, I think you could still apply that system with more up-to-date uh, neuroscience and explaining methods and, and mechanisms. Question of focus, that's probably the biggest thing for me. With the SMA, a lot of times they'll look at a top tier movement and then try to break that movement down until you get to the lowest constituent that's limited and then hopefully you address that and you go back to the start. I've heard a gamut in terms of where you should start in regards to your DMs. Some individuals I've heard start from the neck, work their way down. Some people it's like, well, you pick the one that's most egregious. Doesn't seem to be super clear. When I'm working with a patient, I want as much clarity as possible from a starting point. To me, it makes a lot more sense to start center and work our way outward, or as most proximal work our way distally. Because I can work right here, and I can address multiple of the things that may be a distal limitation. Whereas if you start distally, maybe you get a change, but you might be missing some proximal contributing factor. That would be another reason why I would say that I don't use the, the SFMA. It has to do with order. I think it also has to do with a lack of looking at things from a pattern-based perspective. When I'm performing the assessment that I utilize and that I teach in Human Matrix, I'm looking at the entire person as one piece. And we're choosing interventions that are looking to attack multiple of those pieces simultaneously as opposed to picking one focus, maybe it's working on hip IR on the right side and seeing what shakes out afterwards. I would rather do something that looks at the snapshot of how that person moves or doesn't move, choose one or two moves, and it can be whatever you want. I don't think you have to go into the uh, reset, reinforce, reload style of, of treatment, but, but pick your move that addresses most of the movement limitations that that individual has, and a lot of times you can see changes just about everywhere. I want an approach from a movement standpoint that starts 
systemically or globally and then breaks it down to a reductionist based thing or maybe a local style of treatment as opposed to the other way around, which is what it seems to be advocated in the SFMA based on my rudimentary understanding. Those would be some of the big reasons why I don't use it. Uh, so to summarize the SFMA question, I got no beef with it if you're getting your outcomes. The reasons why I don't use it is I don't like the classification system. I don't like saying movement is dysfunctional because they're probably doing the best they can to survive their internal and external environment. I think that the joint range of motion side of testing from the SFMA is a little bit limited. I would rather look at many more tests than they advocate. I also think that the treatments espoused, meh, we probably aren't changing specific joint mobility, we probably aren't changing specific tissues. It's likely that the manual therapy that we perform works under a similar mechanism regardless of what your target tissue is. Lastly, I think that the order of treatment is, ought to be reversed in the sense that we ought to start proximally, work our way distally, utilize a global perspective before diving into a local's perspective. Whereas the SFMA, based on my understanding, almost has that flip-flopped. Those would be the reasons why I don't utilize the SFMA. Again, I don't think it's a bad system. I know a lot of good people who utilize that, but those were some of the beefs that I had with that system. Do what works for you. Most importantly, do what works for your patients. And I think that that's a good stopping point for us tonight. I want to thank you all so much for tuning in to another show. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you want to learn more about me, here's where you can find me. You can go to ZachCouples.com. While you are there, sign up for my newsletter because you're going to get three hours of me talking about breathing. You're going to get an hour and a half pain talk, 50 pages of notes, a free, yes free, acute chronic workload calculator. You'll also get weekend goodies every Friday. You want to know what's up and coming on the interwebs? I'll find it for you. Definitely check me out on my newsletter. Also, when I start releasing some products, if you want a discount, you better be one of the fam. Fam equals newsletter subscribers. Holla at your boy. Once you've done that, you'll want to click on the services page. Here's what I can do for you. Three things. A movement consultation. Maybe a toy, you're not moving as well as you'd like to. Maybe you got some boo-boos, you ruled out the big bad stuff, and you want to know, man, maybe if I moved a little bit better, I'd probably feel better. I could be that guy for you. What we will do is I will take a look at you. We will see what movement limitations you have. We will address those movement limitations. We will hopefully get you closer and closer to your goals. Definitely hit me up for a movement consultation. Once you are done with that, you'll want to sign up for the mentorship program. Maybe you work with a bunch of yoga peeps and you want to, man, I'm seeing that knee bend all day every day. How do I get that better? I can show you the way. What we will do is we will talk. Yeah, we're going to be on that zoom.us if you know what I'm sizzling. We'll talk through some of the problems that you have. I'm not going to give you the answers right away. I want you to find the answers. We'll work that to, through that to process together so you can help your people because I can't do the job for you. Definitely hit me up for mentorship. Or last, maybe you want just straight gains. Maybe you're post rehab and you're unsure. Yeah, I'm kind of you know, uncertain. I want to get stronger, but I don't want to hurt myself. What do I do? I got the answer for you. It's called online training with Big Z. What we'll do is I will perform a movement consultation on you. We will look at your movement limitations. We will design a program specifically tailored to addressing those movement limitations and we'll get you towards your goals. You'll definitely want to hit me up for online training. Once you've scoured ZachCouples.com, you will want to check me out on iTunes or Stitcher. Search The Zach Couples Show. Because guess what, folks? There are 67 other debriefs you might want to listen to. Yeah, I get it. You want to look at me, too. But you can't look at me in the car. That's dangerous. Definitely sign up for iTunes or Stitcher, The Zach Couples Show. Please leave a review so we can make the fan grow larger. If you are a social media person, here's where you can find me. Facebook, that's you guys. Forward slash Z Couples. The Twitter handle is also at Z Couples. The Instagram baby is Zach, Z A C Couples, C U P P L E S. And last but not least, we can find each other on YouTube. Just search Zach Couples. You'll get a gamut of exercises that more than you probably know what to do with yourself. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. You are all beautiful, sexy, outstanding people. I want you to keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.